Thank you so much for joining our webinar, Content Management is Dead, Long Live Content Collaboration. My name is Melissa Weir, Huddle's Marketing Ops Manager, and I'll be your host for today. Before we get started, let's review a, quick house, a few housekeeping items. This presentation is being recorded and all lines are on mute. We'll go ahead and save some time and open it up for Q&A at the end of this session. To ask a question, type your message into the questions tab in the GoToWebinar console at any time during the presentation. Today we're very excited to have with us Cheryl McQuinnan, Principal Analyst at Forrester Research, and Tim DeLuca Smith, Huddle's Vice President of Marketing. I'll now turn it over to Tim to further introduce himself. Lovely. Uh, thank you, Melissa, and welcome everybody to this Huddle webinar. Content management is dead. Long live content collaboration. And in this session, we're going to talk about what the rise of document-centric collaboration means to today's knowledge workers, and in particular those knowledge workers within accounting and consulting firms. Next slide, please. Now, I don't think there'll be anybody on this webinar that doesn't uh, agree that knowledge workers, particularly those within accounting and consulting professions, rely on timely access to documents and data and the ability to work collaboratively, not only with colleagues, but also with clients that sit, sit external to their business, clients that sit outside of their organization's firewall. So we're going to talk a bit about why content collaboration has become such a driving force behind the knowledge worker, how to collaborate securely with external client, clients and the governance of that collaborative process, why any collaboration strategy you have must guide your tool selection, and some key trends and some vendor considerations. Next slide. Now, again, I don't think anybody would disagree with this statement that the way we all want to work and the way we need to work is changing very, very quickly. Our organizations have become increasingly borderless, and by that I mean the roster of people that we need to engage with and collaborate with on a daily basis has increased beyond those people that sit opposite us in the office. There's a much wider roster of external clients, partners, and suppliers that we need to work with. Secondly, that mobile working has become a norm. We all expect immediate anywhere access to data and documents. The virtual teams as well are becoming more and more normalized. It's not uncommon for us never to meet face to face with people that sit in our project teams. And finally, that we're all expecting more consumer-like experiences in the tools that we're using in an office environment. And yet, despite all of these trends and new ways of working, often it's still too difficult to do the basics, just to share ideas, to manage information and to work together. Next slide, please. I'll, I'll give you some, some statistics around this. 75% um, of employees actually have to move out of applications to relay updates to a wider group. You know, what that means is if you're managing a project, you're, you're constantly having to hop between different tools just to get work done, perhaps from your editing apps into a project management tool, then into email or a chat application to relay updates. Now that breaks audit trails and it clogs inboxes. And one of the other things it does is to increase the amount of what's called copy data that exists. In fact, 60% of enterprise disk space today is filled with document copies. If I create perhaps a proposal, I share it out with several key stakeholders across the business, they'll all make their own edits, amends and revisions, they'll create separate versions and they'll store them on their C drives, in their mailboxes and on network drives. And that makes it really, really difficult to stay synced and up to date with the latest version. And knowledge workers aren't naive to this, they understand the challenges and they understand the technologies that exist out there to help them overcome these challenges. And so they find workarounds. If the organization doesn't give them the tools they need to do their work effectively, they'll go out and find their own, often consumer-grade file sharing applications. And once again, that's when we start to see audit trails being broken and security concerns being introduced. Next slide. So hopefully before I hand over to Cheryl, that gives a little bit of context and adds some highlights to the key challenges that exist to today's businesses and why content collaboration has become such an important aspect of today's enterprise IT stack. 
Now, hopefully most of you will be familiar with Huddle. However, for those that aren't, let me just spend uh, a minute uh, introducing the company before I hand over to Cheryl. And we've highlighted some of the challenges that exist in our, in, our, in our work environments. And I think if we all think about how most of us actually work deep down, we probably all know that it isn't the most efficient way of going about our daily work. Now, Huddle makes working together much simpler. Our cloud-based workspaces make it easy for teams to come together and to collaborate on projects in a secure shared environment. It's here they can share and edit files, they can track projects and activity, and stay in communication with colleagues, with clients, and with team members. And because Huddle is a cloud-based service, it synchronizes all of this activity across users' different devices, so they're always connected to the latest updates and document versions. Next slide. Um, our clients span many different industry sectors, but in particular, public sector and government organizations and those within the advisory sector, so that's accounting, consulting and investment banking firms, for example. If these are all regulated industries and all organizations that understand the challenges of managing collaboration, not only across geographically dispersed teams, but also with this wider ecosystem of partners and clients that we've spoken about. So with that, I'm delighted that we're joined today by Cheryl um, McKinnon, who's going to share some of her own research and some of her own insight into the market for content collaboration. Uh, Cheryl's a principal analyst with Forrester, and she covers the trends, challenges, and recommended practices for managing enterprise content. So Cheryl, I'm going to hand over to you. Great. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the very kind invitation to uh, be a guest on this webinar today. Uh, let's go forward to the next slide. So what I want to talk about over the next approximately 25 to 30 minutes, I want to make sure we've got lots of time for uh, questions at the end of this session, is first off, talk about some of the high-level um, trends going on the broader since technology market and kind of set the tone in terms of some of the really interesting macro forces that are causing organizations to rethink how they make some of their technology investments, particularly in the area of uh, collaboration. I'll then move into some of the key trends that I see uh, affecting the development of the content collaboration, content management market, wrap it up with what it means, and then we can uh, hand it back to our host at Huddle. Next slide, please. So let's just talk a little bit about some of the high-level trends that Forrester is tracking. We've been talking about this concept of the age of the customer for the last couple of years now. And really what it means is that organizations today to be responsive to this highly competitive market we all work in today need to be ever more aware that the customers, whether these are clients in a B2B context or even in a uh, consumer um, context, these buyers are ever more empowered, educated, informed about the products and services that they want to use to be able to fulfill their own requirements. We call this the age of the customer because we see across all industry sectors, especially in knowledge worker uh, rich sectors, companies are starting to adjust their practices, their customer experience practices, make new investments in technologies to serve this ever more educated buyer or consumer. We know that we're able to, with just a, a few clicks on our phone or with our laptop in that mobile context, we're able to get information about what we want to purchase, we want to get that information, we want to do our due diligence, whether that's through web searches, our social networks, our professional networks, and so on. So we know that people are able to make more decisions about their buying cycle before they ever even engage with a sales rep. So in this broader context, we do see that organizations are shifting some of their technology investments to take advantage of this new uh, imperative. Just to put it into some historical context, if we go back to the turn of the previous century, for example, we would have called that the age of manufacturing. So the companies that rose to the top of their market segments or those that recognized and exploited the technology innovations of their day, for example, assembly line techniques, so we saw the rise of companies like Boeing's or Ford's. Move forward to the 1960s, we then were in the middle of the age of distribution. Again, companies that rose to the top of their market segments were those that understood the competitive advantages of taking advantage of things like new transportation systems, whether that's interstate highways, railways, airport hub systems. 
1990s, of course, the age of information, where many of us probably started our careers or our education, the rise of the connected PC, the web, everyone is engaging in uh, creating their own content with email, office productivity suites for the first time. And again, we see the rise of the Amazons, the Googles of the world. So in that context, we're now operating in what we call the age of the customer. Next slide, please. If we think about this age of the customer, what Forrester is tracking is really four high-level market imperatives that are really causing organizations to rethink some of their investments. The first is that we see there's a tremendous desire to transform the end-to-end -end customer, customer experience. And that's not just revamping a website. That's everything from how we serve our customers in a consistent, cohesive effort, whether that's in person, through a mobile app, a web presence, or any other kind of communication channel. We want that consistent service end to end. We see that many organizations now are continuing to accelerate their move into a more digital business, looking for opportunities to streamline manual processes, eliminate needless tasks, move more effectively into a quick customer service. We know that we need to embrace that mobile mind shift. If we look around us, we know that everyone is always looking at their phones or tablets, always carrying their laptops with them now to make decisions, to do homework, to do that market research on, on the go. And of course, finally, to turn big data into business insights. Not just look at data for the sake of data, but really to glean those insights that help us make decisions about the products and the services and the way that we serve our customers. So those four key market imperatives are really starting to shift how organizations think about content management and content collaboration. Next slide. Now we do have some data to back up some of these uh, market imperative uh, assumptions. Uh, one of the things that Forrester does on an annual basis is actually conduct some very large panel surveys. So uh, we do, for example, uh, a global survey of business and technology decision makers, surveying almost 15,000 of them, in fact. And so we ask the question about, you know, which of the following initiatives are most likely to be your organization's top business priorities over the next year? And the data is really interesting. When we talk to this very large group of business and technology decision makers, we see that things like improvement of the experience, customer experience, comes up at a number one uh, response rate, uh, followed very closely by the uh, requirement to improve products and services. And in third position, address rising customer expectations. So we see that globally, enterprises are shifting some of their priorities to really think about how they serve that customer, that educated, empowered customer, make sure that the products and services are what their customers actually need, and improving their overall um, delivery, improving on those expectations. Next slide, please. When it comes to our consulting and audit audience specifically, we see that things like cost reduction also become top uh, market imperatives. So this is actually taking a look at um, some of the respondents specifically in the consultancy uh, industry sector. So if we think about the specific challenges that our, our consultancy customers are facing, we know that we want to look at cost reduction. Uh, that came up as a top priority for 53% of the respondents. But then again, we fall right back into improvement of customer experience. Revenue growth certainly comes up as a top uh, priority, followed by improved business processes. So we do see that there is some vertical nuance here when we talk about the consultancy uh, vertical market. Next slide. We also are starting to realize that as we move into this more digital way of working, more digital way of engaging with our customers and prospects, we're starting to rethink what we mean by the enterprise. Traditionally, we think about the enterprise as really being uh, you know, the colleagues that we work with when, within our four walls or within our virtual uh, organization. But we need to start thinking about this concept of the extended enterprise. We know that we want to engage with our customers, our partners, suppliers, perhaps even citizens, for those of you in the public sector, in the same kind of uh, auditable, compliance-oriented approaches that we do with our own enterprise content. So as we think about moving into our digital way of working, we're starting to see that there's limitations in terms of relying just on email as a communication channel. So we're looking to engage those external participants right in our secure content systems. 
Next slide. When we track the collaboration market, we see specifically around the document-centric collaboration market, there really are four key uh, drivers in terms of what compels organizations to make investment in some of these new digital collaboration and communication tools. The four key drivers are, first off, the requirement to share information, both internally and externally. And I'd say the rise of the requirement to share externally is what's one of the major factors shifting or even disrupting the traditional enterprise content management market. We increasingly want to be able to sync that content securely and reliably across all of the devices that we rely upon to do our work. So I may be using my desktop or laptop in the office, but I know I'm going to continue that project at home on my tablet, so I want that selected set of documents securely synced. We know that we need to have some kind of management capability to make sure that our governance requirements are met, whether that's a repository system or integration perhaps with a system of record. And of course, we know that we want to collaborate. We have colleagues, we have customers, we want to jointly work on items, update our contracts, renew our agreements, and we want to be able to do that without resorting to manual processes. Next slide. So this is a very active, vibrant market right now, uh, and we do see that there's a number of tools that are addressing specific types of use cases, right from the very more uh, simplistic kind of solution. If we look at the left-hand side, more of a point solution for collaboration, perhaps a single use, right through to the vendors that uh, address more of the complex cloud collaboration and productivity suites, everything from uh, integrated approaches. Next slide, please. Three quarters of the uh, software buyers that we polled um, actually do see collaboration technologies as a high or critical uh, priority. Uh, this data point is coming from our uh, 2014 Global Software Survey, and we see that 14% of the uh, technology decision makers rated it as a critical priority, a further 30% uh, as a high priority, and 31% as a moderate priority. So we do see that organizations continue to plan to increase their deployment and use of collaboration technologies across the board. Next slide. And when it comes to some of the consulting and advisory firms that we work with, we know that the management of knowledge assets is more important than ever. Knowledge-based businesses clearly depend on secure, timely access to a lot of the intellectual property they use to conduct engagements, audits, deliver consulting services. The kinds of things that are unique in this particular market are everything from the uh, process and management models that they use to uh, guide their customers any of the intellectual property around things like planning or deployment templates, benchmark data, and of course, thought leadership research. Next slide. So now let's switch over and talk about some of the key trends that are impacting the content collaboration and content management markets today. The first key trend is that we see cloud as really kind of compelling organizations to rethink how they approach the collaboration and management of content. Across the board, if we look at the broader market, vendors right now are actively investing in uh, cloud services, whether that's their own data centers, uh, building out next generation uh, content management or content archiving uh, services. We see many vendors now moving into a cloud-first roadmap, so where the innovation happens, in fact, will be in that software-as-a-service arena. And we see that even um, vendors that have come from the heritage of on-premises deployment even are rethinking some of their packaging and pricing models, moving to more subscription-based or software-as-a-service-based licensing approaches. And of course, because we do live in, a, in a, uh, a hybrid world, we know that uh, we also want to make sure that we've got a strong set of open APIs and the ability to support things like interoperability. Go forward, please. We do see, however, that customer adoption is still in relatively early days. I mean, this is certainly beginning to accelerate as comfort and knowledge and, and uh, education about the security around cloud services certainly is rising. Uh, but we do have questions, uh, particularly from those clients that we talk to in more risk-adverse roles, uh, perhaps records information managers uh, do have questions, you know, wanting to know about, you know, how do I get the vendor to attest to things like security, privacy, things like data center location, particularly for international clients. 
but we do see that education around security practices does drive awareness and acceptance. Next slide. When it comes to collaboration specifically, cloud really is becoming um, kind of the de facto standard. Uh, as part of our uh, 2014 um, software survey, we asked the question, what are your firm's plans to use things like SAS to complement or replace things your, like your existing collaboration strategy? And if we look at the results from uh, just last year, 73% are looking to use cloud uh, for their, their next generation collaboration requirements. Certainly, um, pretty uh, predictable growth there if we go back year over year, back to 2011. So cloud certainly is the uh, dominant model when it comes to collaboration today. Next slide. And another really interesting data point, again, uh, coming from our, our business technographics software survey from last year, we asked the question, how important are various types of benefits? And uh, when we talk about software as a service, the two things that really kind of jump out is, is speed and agility. So the ability to start delivering you know, tangible business results quickly, the ability to start working with your, your customers on engagements um, with these collaborative tools uh, very quickly, and even be much more responsive to new opportunities, to competitive pressures. So speed and agility certainly uh, do drive interest in, in cloud services. Next slide. The second key trend that we're tracking is all around this idea of the mobile moment. We mentioned a moment ago that uh, you know mobility certainly is one of the things that's uh, driving uh, fresh perspectives in terms of software investments. And content is absolutely a key component in terms of enriching uh, these mobile moments. So that moment, you know, when a decision needs to be made, I need information, I need directions, I, not, I need to review a task. We want to be able to do that quickly on the fly, you know, ideally with a, a tablet or a phone device, and be able to make that decision without having to change our context. It's really interesting also when we take a look at some of our, our data that when it comes to um, document heavy work, uh, actually working on, on documents or files, we see that tablets uh, are really an important component in terms of driving engagement uh, with documents and files as part of that overall co-creation activities that you would um, you, you do with your customers, suppliers, or prospects. Next slide. Of course, security continues to be a, a top of mind uh, concern when it comes to working with potentially sensitive content in the mobile context. Uh, this data point is coming from our uh, recent uh, enterprise content management survey just from July of 2015, where we asked the question about, you know, what are the biggest challenges about working with content in the context of mobile? So 57% of the resp respondents, you know, in terms of picking their top challenges, did select the security element, uh, followed closely by uh, support for user experience across different device types and operating systems, and then a further third place at creating and managing content. So again, security continues to be top of mind, and particularly for those of you working in uh, businesses that work with confidential financial human resource data, this certainly has to be a, a top concern. Next slide. Some of the data points around uh, how organizations or how people work with their, their mobile devices. Again, we wanted to understand a little bit of, of the nuance around um, mobile work. So we asked the questions about uh, what kind of device you tend to use for particular activities. And when it comes to these document-rich activities, you see the tablet, uh, the uh, orange line, is a, a dominant tool versus phone, the, the blue. So when we talk about using file sync and share tools, 51% uh, you know, have, have tablet use versus phone. When it comes to things like uh, team document sharing sites, 39% versus 22. So as we get into these document rich, content rich use cases, uh, it is really interesting to see the, uh, how form factor can really help drive adoption. Next slide. The third key trend that we're tracking is around analytics. And the, the rise of analytics, I mean, coming from the world of big data in many cases, are really starting to change the way we think about content. And I think it's really important that organizations, um, you know, we can stop flying blind, perhaps, uh, with um, compared to some of the traditional on-premises applications that many of us have used over the last uh, decade or two decades even, where organizations haven't had a lot of insight into how their content's being used. Uh, 
um, how their applications, in fact, are being used and consumed and where the user experience perhaps is uh, not optimized. As we start seeing the um, richer Im embedding of things like content analytics, this raises the profile of how we're able to extract information, not just out of the documents themselves, but even in terms of how communication patterns are, are flow throughout our organization, being able to mine things like social graphs to know what teams work well together, to have more proactive recommendations about what kind of content perhaps should be uh, consumed. So we're seeing that analytics from multiple angles really are starting to enrich this whole collaborative experience. And again, from a, from a system administrator or from a uh, application administrator perspective, it gives us much more insight in terms of where we can improve and optimize the kinds of um, applications that we deliver to our uh, information workers. And it really helps us you know, kind of move that needle from a more of a reactive approach to much more of a proactive approach. And you know, we think that content you know, really needs to find its home, be, be a considerable part of what Forrester is increasingly calling the system of insight. One of the areas that we've been uh, investigating quite deeply over the last couple of years you know, is the rise of analytics. And what does that mean in terms of being able to extract not just information and data out of our structured and unstructured uh, holdings, but actually the insights that help us make those better decisions. How do I optimize the way I go to market? How do I optimize the content that I push out to my customers as part of an engagement. If we start mining some of this data, some of the past, it means that we can just continue to move that mission further when we talk about improving customer experience or improving our products and services. Going back to some of the top priorities that we mentioned at the beginning of this session here today. Next slide. The fourth key trend uh, is that we're really seeing that external engagement is really driving a lot of new requirements in this whole content ecosystem. You know, this is perhaps, you know, I, although I've got it listed at trend number four, I think this really has been one of the significant uh, quiet but major disruptors in the broader content collaboration and, and management market because we are seeing, you know, the, the direct inclusion of this extended enterprise, so our customers, our partners, citizens if we're public sector, really are becoming part of these digital ecosystems. We want to be able to share content, work collaboratively, and the one-way push of email is starting to show some of its limitations. What organizations want to do today is to be able to safely and securely deliver that managed content out to these external parties. And when we talk about manage content, it means we want to make sure that we've got the auditability, that we know exactly what the correct version happens to me, the, the approved version that's been signed off. So we have that traceability, that auditability, um, and even this around things like rights management, if we want to make sure that they can um, consume that content or perhaps alter it, or we can put an expert on it so that uh, an, an out-of-date proposal isn't accidentally approved. So this is where we're seeing a lot of uh, interest um, it, this is really key as many of us move towards a, a more um, uh, digital way of working so we can to specifically get away from the plagues our business processes. This really moves into what we think about in terms of having supply chain. So that back and forth negotiation with suppliers, with business partners, we want to be able to do that within the, uh, the, the collaborative but uh, secure environment uh, that, that makes sense for us. And of course, this really does reveal the demand for simpler, easy to use technologies. If you think about this concept of the extended enterprise, and we want to be able to share and work with content collaboratively, it means that these are users who will never be able to you know, sit in a one day training course and learn the tool that you're offering to them. These have to be technologies that are very easy to understand, simple mobile apps, simple content uh, consumption and creation. But we need to be, uh, make sure it's as intuitive as possible. And we do have some of the data points to, to back up some of these uh, trends as well. Uh, the question that we asked, this is part of our enterprise content management survey earlier this year, we asked the question, are you allowing external users uh, into your content system? And about two-thirds of organizations want, uh, do have some form of external access or desire that external participation. 24% uh, perhaps is a specific content system designed for that external use uh, purpose. 
uh, but 22% do allow contractors, consultants, their legal teams, uh, service providers, some form of access, and then 12% allowing access to their, their customers. So very interesting that there's about two-thirds of enterprises do want that uh, external collaborative access. Next slide. Uh, we then asked a follow-up question about, uh, so what are the use cases that you want to be able to support? And 51% do want to collaborate with their contractors, their agencies, their consultants. So that demand for these uh, this trusted extended enterprise is, is top of the list there. A further 32% uh, do want secure sharing of their customer or citizen correspondence statements or forms. Next slide. This is a, I know there's some small print here, but I thought that this is really important to, uh, to highlight because as we start seeing organizations move into these new forms of communication with their customers, with their partners, with their trusted providers, um, we see that as a general rule of thumb, enterprises are not keeping pace with some of these new communication uh, forms. Uh, we are not seeing organizations kind of step up and extending their governance, things like retention policies, out to some of these newer, um, more collaborative um, uh, social environments. So this is an area I would flag as a potential concern in terms of future problems around, uh, you know, evidence, e-discovery, investigation, you know, preservation of corporate memory. This is an area that organizations really need to take a look at. The blue bar that circled there, um, what we did was ask the question to uh, uh, over 400 uh, records and information management professionals, for those of you who know the industry association, ARMA, uh, Forrester has been doing joint research with them surveys for the last seven years. And so we asked the question here about which of the following content types or applications does your organization implement uh, technology for managing things like retention? And the blue bar represents the not interested. So this is where organizations are not extending their governance or other kinds of um, uh, retention policies. Uh, top of the list is social or collaboration sites, followed closely by cloud-based file sharing systems, instant messaging, external social media. So general rule of thumb, the newer the content type for the content source, the worse we are at keeping pace with some of our governance policies. So this is a bit of a, a you know, I would say a warning to organizations who are not thinking about how they extend their governance uh, into this new world of uh, external collaboration. Next slide. The fifth trend that I'll highlight here is that we see that as we move into more of these smarter uh, content or process-centric applications, we're starting to see the need for new skills as well as new technology platforms. The architectures that we see out in the content collaboration, content management market are certainly beginning to shift. We're starting to see much more interest in uh, content platforms uh, where um, enterprises can start building out uh, secure, purposeful applications to serve their busy information workers. So perhaps a contract management application, perhaps a deal room application. This is where purposeful work is done in a, in a very simple uh, collaborative approach. Uh, and that's in contrast to some of the heavier footprint, you know, the, the large, uh, usually monolithic architectures of some of the suites um, that many of which were architected in the 1990s. We are starting to see overall from a, an enterprise perspective, this desire to move into a fresher architecture to be able to serve some of these uh, collaborative use cases. And this means that, you know, when we look at uh, building out our teams, we're looking now for uh, more designers, user experience specialists, security and compliance specialists to really take us to that next level of, of uh, productivity and uh, information worker engagement. So those are the five key trends that we'll uh, talk about. Um, let's just look at wrapping it up here. Um, when we talk about the consulting firms specifically, we know that they're, they're looking for fresh platforms to be able to reuse and analyze the key content they use to engage with their customers. Um, in this context, their customer experience means deeper knowledge of customers and the industries in which they work and the ability to deliver services and uh, it engagements in a much more timely fashion. The areas that are of most interest when we, um, when we talk to some of the consulting and advisory firms uh, is first off um, deeper understanding of analytics, uh, investing in platforms that allow a higher degree of things like self-service, 
uh, building out communities or you know communities of practice or expertise uh, both internally as well as sharing that with their uh, with their customers. Um, more client access to the intellectual property that they use to uh, conduct their engagements, and of course that insight, uh, analytics and insight to always understand exactly how applications are being used, what content, or content is being consumed, those reporting to help us uh, have that dashboard view into how we can optimize our content in the applications. And you know when we think about the um, you know, the, this age of the customer, there's a few implications that come from that. It means that data and information wants to move much more freely between the enterprise and the customer, and perhaps even without any kind of human intervention. Uh, companies or enterprises want to be able to serve their customers who are trying to get their homework done, trying to make those decisions in, in the most efficient way as, as possible. We know that we want to in encourage interactions across individuals as well as uh, the people who we know are, are increasingly mobile, remote. People are on the road constantly. We don't want to uh, have the, the content experience suffer because of any of these changing factors. So cloud really is an important enabler of this changing uh, work environment. Next slide. But we do see that various uh, habits persist. Um, we are, are still in, um, you know, well down the path of still seeing email as one of the primary communication channels. Uh, we asked the question um, earlier this year as part of our uh, devices and security workforce survey, how do you share documents or files with other people? And not surprisingly, email still persists, 87%. Uh, share documents with other people by sending them as email uh, attachments. Uh, even 67% put them on a shared network drive. So old habits do die hard. Next slide. And there are some, some concerns about this. I mean, as we move into a much more digital way of working, we do have to think about how do we, we find that perfect balance between security and productivity. For example, when we talk about perfect security, perhaps that 1% of the intellectual property or sensitive information that is uh, most precious to our organization, we know that we need a high degree of security and governance built around that. But it may be overkill for a lot of the other documents and files that you need to share. On the other hand, the left-hand side, minimum security actually doesn't do the job as well. And when we think about our habit to kind of revert back to email, this is one of the risks that we incur. Once I email a particular document, I know that it's really out of my control. I don't know who's going to forward it, copy it, print it out, leave it somewhere in a public location. So that's kind of a, on, on the left-hand side. Companies need to find that right balance. You know, my security and risk colleagues at Forrester refer to this as the minimum viable security. So what's that right balance for your business, for your content, and of course the customer uh, files and documents that you need to work on. Next slide. We published a report earlier this year on information governance, and I think this is a really important point to think about. You know, we do have a lot of organizations uh, across verticals that are building out an information governance strategy, kind of rethinking how they apply things like uh, policies to not just content but data as well. And one of the things that we recommend for organizations that are trying to reboot or uh, build from scratch a new governance uh, strategy is to not neglect that outside-in perspective. You know, what is the, the expectation of your business partners or of the regulators or of your clients in terms of how you, as, a, as an advisory firm, as a consulting firm, how do you hold that information? How do you protect it? How do you preserve it? Um, Thinking about that outside in perspective you know, is, is a really important component as a governance program is established because um, we've actually got some data again from our security and risk team that actually tracks you know, what are the, um, the compliance issues that really do um, cause businesses to suffer, whether it's revenue loss, reputational loss, and it's often not that million dollar fine, it's more likely losing trust uh, on, in terms of your, your customer expectations. So, Taking that outside-in perspective in terms of expectations is really a key recommendation for those of you thinking about uh, an overall uh, information governance uh, strategy. Next slide. And with that, I'm happy to turn it back to our host to huddle. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, absolutely fascinating to see 
Forrester's own data and how it really reinforces this concept of the extended enterprise and how businesses are looking at technology to improve not only the collaborative but the client experience and, and certainly from our own uh, experiences we're seeing clients advance very quickly from those very sort of early stage uh, cloud sharing tools into this new set of tools that really embrace the notion of, of collaboration and how it relates to both internal and external users and, and tools that don't just sit on the periphery of the business but are really baked into, into the enterprise IT stack. So we have had a, a couple of questions that have come through on the uh, on the panel. Um, if you do have a question, um, it's your last chance. Do do submit it through the chat, the chat panel. But let me just pick up a couple of a couple of ones that that came through. And um, the first we had um, says uh, we use SharePoint at the moment. It's it's not perfect, especially for external collaboration, but IT mandate its use. Um, how do you build a business case and measure value around yet another? collaboration tool um, that's a really great question and that's 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 something that we talk to clients about a lot I think that you know as the market matures everybody's realized that there is no one tool that can do everything um, for the majority of our own clients you know they are using SharePoint as well but they recognized where it breaks um, you know and it typically starts to break down around this concept of external collaboration when you need to start inviting uh, external users into a system and that's when um, you know IT teams get a little bit twitchy about putting people into into the active directory you know remember tools like SharePoint were never you know particularly built for external collaboration and that's why people often get so frustrated with the hurdles that exist when you try and work with people outside the firewall so your business needs to to really start mapping tools to specific use cases what are you trying to do with this tool um, you know most of our clients use SharePoint as that system of record for archiving but start to use tools such as huddle to deliver that more social experience that that external collaboration overlay and when you're starting to build a business case I would certainly advise uh, and certainly when we when we build business case for our own clients I would advise uh, three buckets of value. I think you've got your hard costs, which is can you reduce your reliance on enterprise storage and start to leverage the cloud uh, more? Can you reduce your dependency on legacy uh, software costs? Um, then I think the second bucket, bucket is around productivity. How do these collaboration tools help you to perform better how can you deliver projects uh, to time and to scope quicker um, just even the 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 removal of searching through reams of email attachments to find the latest version you know when you're stretching that across the entire enterprise uh, can be an enormous uh, piece of value and then finally there's sort of softer value buckets which are around business gains how by using these tools and connecting virtual teams from across your business can you start to connect subject matter expertise and knowledge from across your your business to perhaps improve how you respond to bids think of a bid management team that, that extends across uh, multiple multiple sort of virtual teams how do you bring those all together and get those bids out to time and to scope how by extending your network and this content out to clients through client portals for example do you you know retain customers and improve that 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 client experience as Cheryl spoke about so there's a number of different ways of sort of establishing uh, establishing that um, a second question that we got in um, is a really good one um, it asks you know how do you ensure people actually use tools like this isn't this just another set of tools for users to learn and is that reflected in adoption rates um, it's a really important question to ask um, you know tools like this collaboration tools um, can't be seen as a technology drop you know these shouldn't be tools where they're just thrown in dropped in by IT they sit on the periphery they're not baked into the enterprise IT stack uh, and they're dropped in by IT with with very little user engagement I think you know collaboration is in, inherent in all of us we all want to be able to collaborate easier and I think that makes collaboration tools and content collaboration as much about people and culture 
as it is about the technology. So you know you need to ensure that any kind of deployment like this comes with a customer success program, for example. Um, you know, at Huddle, our, our, our customer success team spend an awful lot of time working with clients to to manage training, to onboard people, to help them think more collaboratively, to help them circumvent some of those legacy uh, legacy tools um, that exist. Um, we have time for one more. I'm going to be brief in my response to try and keep this webinar to time because I think it's um, uh, it's a question that relates to a current very uh, newsworthy topic. Um, question, I am in the UK, there's been a lot of news around the legitimacy of Safe Harbor uh, as a buyer. What are the implications for tools such as this that store data in the cloud? Very timely question. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, Safe Harbor uh, was an agreement I think signed something like 15 years ago now between the EU and the US uh, over the protection of European data if it's stored on US servers and recently in the last couple of months uh, European court rulings have concluded that uh, such protection afforded to European data uh, isn't sufficient to protect the privacy of European citizens so safe harbor is void. Um, that's that's been an issue for a number of vendors, um, cloud vendors who only uh, who only maintain U.S. data centers. Um, that's not to say that um, both the vendors aren't working around this, nor that Safe Harbor will no longer be relevant. It'll be redrafted, but absolutely, uh, if it is going to be an issue to you, you do need to ensure that you're talking to vendors that uh, have European and US uh, data centers and are able to guarantee the sovereignty of your data. So that means where that data is stored. If you do need it in the UK, you know, look for a vendor with a UK, a UK data center. Um, so I think that's all the time um, that we have. I hope this webinar has been useful. I want to thank Cheryl once again for joining us. Very valuable to have some some real insight from from a leading uh, from a leading analyst. Um, do come and visit us at huddle.com. You can follow us on Twitter uh, at huddle or uh, direct any email inquiries to sales at huddle.com. Um, and with that, um, I will close the webinar. Thank you all for attending.